On the 22nd of July 2011, Oslo was struck by a very powerful car bomb that went off just next to the Prime Minister's office. Eight people were killed immediately and hundreds were injured. Panic struck Norwegians tried to figure out why they have been attacked, why they have been added to the long list of uh, cities that have been attacked by Islamic jihadists. They searched and they discovered many reasons. Uh, they found that uh, uh, Norway has been contributing troops to the uh, NATO war effort. They found that the Muslim community of Norway had not been properly integrated into the society. They also found that just a week before, a Muslim preacher had been indicted for incitement. And while the country was still trying to make sense of this fog of war, there was another attack, a simultaneous attack, that happened a couple of hours later in a school summer camp where more than 69 uh, people were shot dead, including personal friends of the Prime Minister and some of the members of the royal family. And of course, names started popping up. This was, uh, uh, had to be a, a jihadist attack, a responsibility, some Al-Qaeda, other names started popping up. But ironically, it was none of that. This entire terror attacks were the handiwork of one man whose name was Anders Berwick. And he was a Norwegian, and he hated Muslims, and he was actually protesting against the multiculturalist policies of the Norwegian government. My second story is about this man. He goes by the name of Salim Durani. He has many names. He operated in the valley for about 10 years. He used to move in and out. Uh, the fences and the boundaries were never a problem for him. He has a prize on his head when he was operating in the valley. And he's been known to be personally responsible for the deaths of close to three to four dozen young men. Uh, he's also a devout Muslim, prays five times a day. Uh, he has uh, his AK-47 next to him like a true warrior. Each time he prays, wherever he sleeps, never sleeps in the same place twice, not for two nights in a row. Salim Durani is uh, my course mate uh, from the Indian Army. This is a picture of him when he was a major serving in the valley. Between him, his father, and his grandfather, three generations, they have contributed eight uniformed services officers into the Indian Armed Forces. And between them, they hold six gallantry awards and two commendation cards. <laughs> the young lad that you see sitting on the left is Salim's son, who is now planning to join the Indian Military Academy and continue the family tradition for the fourth generation of service to this country. Now, when I told you these two stories, your mind instantly leapt to a conclusion that was wrong. You thought of Salim Durrani when I began as a terrorist, AK-47, Valley, and your mind jumped to a conclusion which was... The feature of our way of stereotypical thinking is we will usually think of the worst case scenario. That is why Salim Durrani is a terrorist and not amongst the thousands of Muslim officers and soldiers who serve in the Indian Armed Forces. And why do we do that? Why do we always gravitate towards the worst case scenario? Now the answer for that is also our human evolution of the brain. Now suppose we went back into history as we were evolving and there were these two tribes. There was tribe one and tribe two and tribe one consisted of brave, fearless warriors and they would see a mammoth and they'd say, I would take on this mammoth by myself. They'd come to a chasm and they say, I'd run and jump across the chasm and flap my wings and get across. They would see a bright red fruit and say, I'd bite into it, forget the consequences. And tribe two said, when they saw a mammoth, I can't take on this mammoth by myself, I need to go and get some more people. Or they came to a chasm, they decided to walk all the way down, come up the other way, build a bridge or whatever. And they saw this bright fruit, but say, you know what, I'll stick to my boring bananas. Whose descendants do you think we are? Tribe one or tribe two? Tribe two, tribe one didn't have descendants, they died. 